Jen Winhall, you're a psychotherapist, you were a social worker, and you've developed the felt sense polyvagal model, mixing felt sense experience that you've created and Stephen Porges polyvagal theory. Can you tell us how the polyvagal theory changed your approach and what is the felt sense polyvagal model? Big question. <laughs> I've got a lot of big, big questions today. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so, um, well, the journey really started uh, 40, over 40 years ago when I began working with a group of young women who were incest survivors. Mm. And uh, I was, you know, fresh out of graduate school. It was um, really a very intense experience. But it taught me so much because... Um, I was part of the women's movement back then. And uh, as Judith Herman writes, you know, in her, in her work, Trauma and Recovery, and then again in her new book, Truth and Repair, um, we really uh, valued and um, placed a lot of emphasis on listening to clients. Mm. And that was really the place, the source where most of our information was coming from as opposed to buying into a very pathologizing model, uh, particularly of women. Um, because back, you know, then and, and even now, the system, uh, you know, often uh, diagnosed these women, trauma survivors, especially that were engaging in self-harm as uh, having borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were listening with what I call depathologizing ears. And what we heard and what I saw in these women's bodies were really powerful shifts in their bodies in terms of um, how they were uh, relating the story of trauma, um, but also how they were using um, what became addictive behaviors uh, mm -hmm. to help them to shift from these intense states that we now understand through bringing in the autonomic nervous system, which is what Steve Porges has really uh, given to us. Now we understand that as a sympathetic rush in the body. But back then, Judith Herman understood it through the autonomic lens, but she was okay. medically trained. And we, we weren't. So we, we didn't talk about that. We talked about flooding, which we meant as sympathetic, and numbing, which is the dorsal branch of the vagus that Steve Porges has named for us, this dissociative state, um, and brought into a new understanding of the autonomic nervous system. So it was really through... Um, eventually finding Steve's work, that it began to really make sense to me what these states in the body uh, were actually about, you know, the sympathetic response, the ventral vagal response of grounding, and the dorsal response. And what I put together was that really the function of addictions and mm -hmm. self-harm was to shift people from one autonomic state to the other, that that's how addictions function, and that they're actually very adaptive when we don't have enough safety. And so we're depathologizing addiction and understanding it as a state regulation strategy. Okay. Yeah. So the, the clearest kind of way to understand that is to think about alcohol, for example. Yeah. Oftentimes, you know, people will uh, say you come home from work and you're really uh, fired up, you know, you're really tense, you're in that sympathetic, anxious state. Drinking a bottle of wine shuts that nervous system down into a numbing dorsal state, which brings relief into the body. Yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. And it can also work the other way. So harder to understand uh, self-harming behaviors like cutting, for example. Yeah. Um, but when we really look into that as well, it begins to make sense in terms of how bodies work. 
So when we cut the body, either um, we fly up into a kind of sympathetic response from numbing mm -hmm. and it wakes us up or it shuts us down by releasing endogenous opioids, which create dissociation. So again, this is the body's wisdom in an environment where there are no choices. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we move, we shift paradigms. We're not talking about pathology anymore. We're talking about the wisdom of the body to adapt to different yeah. situations, different circumstances um, in order to survive. Now, there's a problem with that which can occur because bodies through neuroplasticity can get stuck in ruts, right? Okay. We call this the trauma feedback loop. So then we end up getting triggered by situations that occur that in somehow activate these bodily responses of um, heightened threat. Um, and sometimes, you know, they happen when we actually aren't under threat because we have these old pathways that become ruts, really, uh, and we fall into those. So that's where our job comes in as therapists, right? That we teach our clients how to basically rewire, how right. to shift out of those ruts, those neural pathways that become um, stuck, and through beautiful embodied practices, and that's where I found the work of Jean Gendlin, and focusing and working with the felt sense in the body. Oh, okay. Yeah. You talk about alcoholism. Before I discovered polyvagal theory, I worked on stress and burnout. And we worked a lot about relationship with work. Is workaholism an addiction we can take care of with your model and how? Mm. Yeah, I like to keep the definition of addiction really simple. So I see addictions as, um, you know, it's a way of uh, helping you in the beginning. So something, whatever that is, an activity, a substance that helps you, it brings relief in the beginning. And then it eventually it starts to harm you in some way. So whether it numbs you, but it also then, of course, say with alcohol, in particular, uh, and drug, drug abuse that would really harm the body. With work, um, it's harmful because we can get into these locked states of dissociation. So they harm us and we can also get overstressed and we're not able to regulate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we lose social engagement. We lose connection with uh, people around us. And, and so it helps you in the beginning. It hurts you in the long term and you can't stop doing it. Right. So when those three things are present, that's what I like to think of in a very simple way in terms of addiction. So, you know, sometimes people will say, say with work, for example, that they might uh, work at regular hours for several months and then they binge. Yeah. You know, a project comes up and they binge, but they binge in a way that is, It, it takes them away from everything except work, right? And maybe yes. that happens four or five times a year. So they'll say, well, that's not an addiction because I don't do it every day. Or even with drinking or whatever it is that you're doing, right? Masturbating, whatever it is that's, yeah. that's, that's helping you in the beginning. Um, but we know that if we think about it in terms of, you know, it helps you at first or it's, it's, it's regulated and fine at first, say with work. Mm -hmm. um, but then it starts to harm you because you have these periods that are totally dysregulated and not healthy and you can't stop buying into that cycle that repeats itself through binging. So absolutely pretty, you know, so many things can become addictive. So your model is here to help people stop their addiction or yes. to understand to understand how the body is working and okay. to be able to move back into, in polyvagal terms, a ventral vagal state where the body is in a state of grounding okay. and feels safe enough to settle. Mm -hmm. And in that state in the body, 
you know, we know that uh, that's when our immune system works well. It's when we feel um, socially connected to other people. You know, Steve Porges talks a lot about social engagement. Yes. So that ventral part of the vagus nerve is above the diaphragm and then up into the face, right? And it's the vagus nerve that really carries like 80% of the information in the vagus nerve that stretches. It's the longest cranial nerve goes right down into the center of the body and then up into the brainstem. And it carries all this information about what's going on in our bodies. And we've really left our bodies behind in our culture, right? In the Western oh, yeah. culture. We don't really allow to listen body. to our body. Mm. Yeah. So Jenlin's work, so we got Porges' work with neuroception, uh, the, the term that he created for the process in the body that monitors how safe we are mm -hmm. and unconsciously shifts us into these different states in order to adapt, in order to survive. And then we've got the other process that we bring into the felt sense polyvagal model of interoception. And this yes. is the felt sense process that Jendlin and many people talk about. Um, I use the felt sense because I trained with Jendlin for over 30 years. And I really think his work is, um, is the basis. It's the foundation of understanding how change happens in the body. Okay. Yeah. And so key then to the model, Sandra, is the crossing or the um, connecting of these two embodied processes. The uh, what I saw and grew to understand over the years in these young women in my group was that when they were able to pause over time to come into the body, into what's happening in their body in terms of how they understand and experience their life. So when we can feel safe enough to slow things down, this is what we did over time in the group, and I still do in groups, and really create enough safety that people can pause and begin to know themselves internally. Okay. So what's going on inside me now? And focusing developed through Jendlin's research that he did with therapists and clients who uh, all reported really positive outcomes. So he was curious. He and actually Carl Rogers, who was his teacher, um, they asked therapists and clients, well, you know, what, how does this work? How, how do you think this is helpful? And what they found in recording um, the tapes of these sessions, because it was way back in the 50s, the 1950s and 60s, there was no, you know, videoing that we're doing now. They found these long pauses where clients weren't saying anything and neither were therapists. And this was, you know, unusual. It was like, what's going on here? Because it wasn't the content of the talking that was creating the change. Yeah. It was what's happening in the body. So they do nothing, but it wasn't uh, uncomfort uncomfortable. Yes, yes. It's different so they, because we don't, we know, we are not used to silence. Yes, exactly. But there was something about these particular clients who were doing well in therapy and making yeah. a lot of change in their lives. They were comfortable with silence. They were going into the body, and they were listening to what Jendlin then called the felt sense. Okay. And this is like this, the, the body's knowing that something's going on that we don't quite know yet consciously. Okay. So for example, I mean, people would talk about it in terms of intuition, or they might say this kind of, oh, I had this, in English, we would say like an inkling an inkling of an idea or something's niggling at me that you know, it's bugging me, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So it might be even something as simple as, you know, you leave the house to go meet a friend for lunch and something doesn't feel right inside. You're like, Something's not right. And then you realize I forgot to lock the door. 
Yeah. Okay. So that place that was bugging you, that's the body's knowing. Mm. And so when we're quiet, and this is what Jen Lynn discovered, when we calm things down and we're quiet, and particularly when somebody comes with us, when they accompany with us um, into that space of quiet, a lot of information is in there that we don't hear. We bypass it because we ignore the body. Yeah. So we're, we're really in somatic therapy. We're saying, slow things down, connect with body process. What's your body telling you? So in the felt sense polyvagal model, we look at neuroception, how safe do you feel and what state are you in? You know, are you, are you tight up and constricted and ready to mobilize? Or are you feeling pretty good and chill today? Or maybe you're really shutting down, phobia, collapsing. And when you learn how to identify that state, then we teach clients ways to be able to shift into more regulation. Yeah. And, and one of those ways is again. through focusing. Okay. Connecting in, going down. Mindfulness meditation is like this too. Mindfulness is, is focusing is similar to mindfulness, but it's also different because we really, in focusing, we really spend time slowing things down and listening to those places that are bugging us. It's a way of working with issues in your life. And as you stay with that, there's often this beautiful shift that occurs because bodies like it when we keep them company. Yeah. And, and that shift is what I brought together in the model to say, ah, that felt shift that we talk about in focusing where you feel this physical release <clears throat> and things just feel better. It's like, oh God, I forgot my keys. Ah, that feels better. I know what I need to do now. That kind of a shift is also a shift in the nervous system. Yeah. Often a shift from the sympathetic into relaxing mm -hmm. or from the sluggish, depressed into some vitality. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the felt sense polyvagal model is where I brought together that felt shift in the body that feels better about your life and how that also then activates a shift in the nervous system into feeling more safe, more present, more connected to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So polyvagal theory is a way of understanding our nervous system with the feelings of safety, danger, life threat. It's the science of connection, attachment, communication, emotion, self-regulation, but it's not a protocol. With the Felsen's polyvagal model, you've provided the protocol. Yes. And the, yes. And this is what you explained, the focusing. Or, mm -hmm. And you've provided two graphic models. I love your yes. work because it's very visual. One for the clinician and one for the patients. Yes. I've, I've translated them into French. Beautiful. Can you explain us how you use them in therapy? Uh, sorry, can I explain which? Oh, you use the oh, how I use them. Yeah, therapy. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the clinician model was the first one, really, that I created. But my, my clients looked at it and said, ah, it's too complicated. <laughs> So together with my, with my clients and students, we created the client version, the six Fs, we call it, because yeah. in English, um, those, those words, each of those words start with an F to make it simple, just to make it simple. And so I started um, printing them out on um, big, you know, three by five boards. Yeah. And I would have them in my office when I was still seeing lots of clients and doing groups and before COVID when we were, when we were live. Um, and now I use them on my, on my desktop and I bring them up and we go through them and 
notice or we call them or call it orienting to the model where am i when i look at that graphic version where do i feel that that i am in my body and i i made it graphic i made it with color and i made it with circles because this i think is the language of the body yes so we look so here and some people put it on their fridge they yeah. put it on the mirror in their bathroom in the morning <laughs> particularly if we're working with addiction sandra we use this a lot in terms of helping people to connect with where am i today and what do i need to do to help myself if i don't feel particularly grounded in ventral to come into a more grounded state and so we really encourage people to have daily practices where they are using the model to locate where they are in their body through neuroception and then teaching them the practice of focusing in particular and there are lots of others it's a gen it's basically a foundational model you can bring any kind of therapy into it just yeah. work with the body with the two body processes um and some people, you know, they use it also with their, their partners and with their children. If oh, kids okay. understand, they, they get in their bodies what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so it gives you a doorway in, in a fairly uh, fun, almost kind of way of recognizing, oh, yeah, I'm up in that chaotic place. Whew, what do I need to do? So we might do some breathing, some movement some connecting into the felt sense. How is my life going inside? Brings us back to integration. Yeah. Okay. In your model, there are three blended states. Yes. It's fun and fired up is for playing. A mood so ventral and sympathetic. Orgy talks a lot about play in these books. Yes. And two others that are really new and that I would like to talk about. First of all, you know, describes the freeze state as a blend of dorsal mobilization and sympathetic mobilization, explaining that this blending state plays an important role in addiction. Can you tell us more about that? Because I thought that the freeze state was, was only dorsal. You thought the freeze state was what? Only was dorsal. Dorsal. The dorsal? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I thought it was the dorsal state too, uh, until after I after I wrote the first part of my book, I sent it uh, over to Polyvagal Institute, and um, and I got this feedback: Jan, the freeze state isn't dorsal; it's a blend. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was the same for me. I saw an illustration from the Polyvagal Institute. Yeah. I, I, Everybody, I think, thought that in the beginning, yeah. right? I think we all thought that in the beginning. But but the thing is, again, if you go back into your body, mm -hmm. in a freeze state, we're with the rabbits with the headlight, right? We're stuck. Now, if you feel into your body, Sandra, that state is not limp. It's constricted, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. like this. It's constricted. We're waiting for something. Yes. And that constriction is sympathetic energy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And as soon as I got that, I got it. It was like, oh, yes, of course, it's blended. It's a blend of sympathetic constriction and immobilization of the dorsal. So you can't move, that's the immobilization of dorsal, but it's a blending with the sympathetic constriction. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Whereas so what's... dorsal is limp. The muscles yeah. are limp. There's no constriction in dorsal. It's a shutdown state. Yeah. And is there a link with addiction? The link with addiction is that addiction occurs in that state in between, it's also part of that state of being stuck between uh, surging up into sympathetic and then shutting down into dorsal and going back and forth in what we call okay. that trauma feedback loop at the top half of the model. Okay. So in the top half of the model, 
Addictions occur and they function to shift people from chaos to rigidity, from that flight, fight, sympathetic, down into folding into dorsal, or back again, as we yeah, discussed, okay. let's say with cutting, for example, mm-hmm. or drugs and alcohol. So that's how we understand addictions through a polyvagal lens. And then, of course, what happens is when you're living in the bottom half of the model, the ventral blended states and, and the ventral um, flock state, uh, there's no need for addictions. We don't need to be shifting back and forth in that way. The body flows in yeah, this okay. physical kind of way. So it's a very helpful way of understanding the function of addiction and that it's not a disease. It's it's um, It has a very clear adaptive quality to it. And that you can, people, people can stop, right? People stop all the time into what they call natural recovery, I think. People just stop. Yeah. Stop doing whatever that is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't stop an illness because you will it. Yeah. It's 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 a decision that when I guess enough ventral energy is there, there's enough motivation, people are able to stop. And then they move down into that ventral pathway, neural pathway. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Mm. You also talk about the flow state and say that it is a blend of ventral and dorsal response. As I understood flow state, I saw that we needed a sympathetic impulse before going to a state of mastery where everything seems easy and effortless. So is this state of, of mastery the blend of ventral and dorsal response? You're saying that you understood the flow state as a state of mastery? I saw that we need more sympathetic than ventral, but you put dorsal in the flow state. So, what? What? Uh, why is this in blame? You're, you're saying that um, when when we're in, say, a ventral state, and then there's a threat, that we first go to sympathetic. I saw that we need the sympathetic energy to begin the flow, but on your uh, model, the flow state is between ventral and dorsal. Yes, that is the state of stillness, right? Okay. Where, the, where in, in there's enough ventral energy there that we're able to feel safe enough in the body to be still. Okay. And in that state, there there isn't a lot of sympathetic. It's a real. It's what Steve talks about in terms of um, stillness. Yeah. Okay. You know, that it feels, it's like we're in this sweet spot of feeling safe enough. And then we can allow the body to relax enough that we can be still. So lovemaking is a place like this, breastfeeding, Mm -hmm. giving birth, if we're lucky, if we have enough Mm -hmm. safety. Um, Meditation, sitting quietly in meditation or in focusing where we feel into the body, this sense of ventral energy of movement um, in terms of, you know, breath regulation and feeling calm inside, but without flight fight. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, if we want to mobilize, so maybe this is part of what your question is, if we want to mobilize, and I've talked to Steve about this, actually, we do need some sympathetic energy to move, to get up. And that's where some of that sympathetic energy would come, but just enough to help us to mobilize and come back down into ventral again. Because uh, when we talk about flow states, we also think about artists performing or sportsmen and it's in action yes yes and and i think people use the word flow in different ways too okay so you can be um you can use the word flow a flow state and be like say a runner for example but that's that's not how i mean flow in the model okay so that's why yeah that's why yeah 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 yeah. because i worked uh, to make this between polyvagal theory and the flow states as described by Mialis in Zen Miali. And mm. it's more active. 
In yes, the, yeah, it's just picture. a different use of the word, yeah. Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know there's a lot of resources on your website. Yes. There's your paper, Creator with Stephen yes. Forges. Yes, that was wonderful to write that with Stephen. Yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. There's the graphics models, but there are yes. also the body cards to represent what we feel and the four circles practice. Yes, can, yes. Can we introduce these tools directly on your practice, or do we need to teach ourselves how to use them and how? I would say that it's really important to teach ourselves how to use them first, because, okay. and this is what I do in all of my trainings, we form focusing relationships together, partnerships, and we do the practices together so that people know, you know in your body how those practices feel in you. Okay. before you are inviting your client to co-regulate with you in the practice. Mm -hmm. you know, so from a very a somatic uh, viewpoint, we want to be familiar with the practices first. And that's where uh, in the trainings where people have focusing partnerships and then they take all of the practices and the concepts into an embodied way of experiencing them. And when that happens, we really are our own instrument in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So we embody the journey. We know that journey inside ourselves. And that then makes the co-regulation so powerful. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Is there some uh, upcoming course in French? Maybe with Florence Bernard? Uh, yes, I am doing a, a training with Florence uh, and Mark in, I think it's September. Yeah, okay. because they had a conference and now uh, there's a master class that's coming up with them in the fall that I'm doing. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I will great. add the link to your website and the Polyvaga Institute community where you're very active under the video and in the article. Do you have some news to share, an upcoming course, something we need to know about to go further into your approach? Some news about courses, did you say? On anything uh, that you want ah. to share? Uh, I'm in the, the, the throes of... Uh, working on a new workbook that would be for um, people using the uh, Felsen's polyvagal model um, as clients in working with addiction in particular. So I'm very excited about that. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, that's going to be great, I think. And that's just in the works now. And uh, lots of trainings coming up in Europe. And of course, my certification course on the Polyvagal Institute, that happens once every six months. So we've just started a new cohort. Okay, and so it's, we have it's to wait. so wonderful because so many people that are working so deeply in the body are coming to the course and they have these beautiful focusing partnerships. So we learn all of the concepts through the body. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Will your book be translated in French? Uh, the this book I uh, we're working on one. that right now. The book that I have now is being translated in Italian. Okay. And we're looking at Spanish as well, and French is. Uh, I'm talking about it with people. Oh, cross fingers. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're cross fingers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. That was great.